Hi everybody. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about what makes science different as a way of knowing. Now, I want you to start by asking yourself, how do you know things? All the things that you know about the world, about your life, about the people around you, think about how you know them. So, if you're Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones, the answer is you drink and you know things. Most of us know things a few other ways instead. One way that we come to know things, come to believe things to be true about the world, is because of authority. As little kids, we have teachers who tell us things, we have parents who tell us things. When we get older, we have people out in the world who claim different kinds of authority. We take it from them because they have some kind of a position of prominence or stature in our lives or in the world at large. That's one way that we know things, is because somebody told us so. Another way that people know the things they know is through faith. Faith can be a religious experience, taking something on faith because of a revelation, or it can be just an everyday sense of, of secular faith, that you believe things because you just trust that they're true. A third way that people know things is introspection. People look inside of themselves and they check their intuitions or their feelings. Another way that people know things is imagination. So we have art and music and literature that shows us what's possible, what could be true, and we use that to expand our horizons and learn about the world. Now, I'm not going to be telling you that any of these are wrong or that you shouldn't rely on them. There are lots of ways of knowing things in the world. There are more than these. What I want to do in this video today is to talk to you about science as a way of knowing and talk about how it's different from some of these, in particular, how it's different from your own observations. So one important feature of science is that science is an empirical way of knowing. Now, what does empirical mean? Well, here's a dictionary definition. Empirical means originating in or based on observations or experience. Now, that's something that scientists do, but that's also something that we do ourselves in our everyday lives. And so I want to talk a little bit about how scientific empiricism might be different from everyday empiricism. So here's an example. Suppose I tell you, when I take a vitamin B12 supplement, I have more energy the next day. Now that is based on my experience and my observations of my own life, but it's an everyday sort of empiricism. Let's unpack that and look a little bit at what that means. So suppose I've kept a diary, maybe on an app or in a, a notebook of my energy level for 10 days in a row. Every day at the end of the day, I write down on a scale from one to 10, how much energy did I have today? And now suppose during this 10 day period, I take a vitamin B12 supplement every time I feel like I have low energy to see if it boosts me the next day. That means I'm going to be taking the vitamin B12 supplements on these days. Now maybe you can already start to see some of the challenges to using this as a source of evidence. In this example, my inference that vitamin B12 boosts my energy is potentially subject to something called a selection effect. We're going to learn about selection effects later in this course. What it means in general is that the days when I took vitamin B12 were systematically different from the days when I didn't. I took it when I had low energy. There could be something about that that made it look like the vitamin B12 was helping me when it really wasn't. And later in this course, we're going to talk about something called regression to the mean that could be an alternative explanation. And the problem is, as your book puts it, life doesn't have a comparison condition. I can't compare what actually happened to me what, to what would have happened if I'd done things differently. So I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't taken the vitamin B12 supplement on those days. Maybe I would have felt the same way the next day anyway. I don't know what would have happened if I'd taken it on other days. Maybe it would have produced a boost, maybe it wouldn't have. So this everyday way of knowing, sometimes it's the best we can do, but it's not systematic, it's missing out on some important things. Now, observation and experience isn't always just a single episode or a single, like, keeping a diary for 10 days. We also have things like our intuitions. Our intuitions are based on our experiences in the world. You start to develop a sense of what the world is like through your repeated observation and experience over the course of your life. And intuition can be very powerful because it aggregates over all these experiences we've had, but it also can have some limitations. I want to talk to you about a few of those to give you some sense of why. So start with the question, let's imagine I were to ask you or you were to ask people on the street, what is a more common cause of firearm deaths in the United States? Is it death by suicide or death by homicide? Take a moment and just try to think about what your answer would be. 
ignore the fact that you're in a lecture on scientific thinking and just what would you have said if somebody just asked you this out of the blue? Well, if you ask people, a lot of people will tell you that they think that death by homicide is more common than death by suicide. In fact, that is not true at all. In the United States, deaths by suicide, firearm deaths by suicide in particular, are one and a half to two times as common as firearm deaths by homicide. They're way more common. Why do we think that it's the other way around? Well, one reason is that we get a lot of our information from news, from other media. Homicide deaths get covered more, and when they do get covered, they tend to grab our attention. In fact, if you take one particular category of homicide deaths, mass shootings, and you were to ask how common are mass shootings, they wouldn't even appear on this chart. They'd be a line down at the bottom because they're quite rare. Now, this does not mean that the media is wrong for covering them out of proportion to other kinds of deaths. That's a value judgment. That's a priority judgment for the media. Sometimes there are really important reasons to be covering rare but important events. However, because we're passive consumers of the media, we get our sense of the world through it, the proportions and the, the attention grabbingness of ways things are covered will infiltrate into our intuitions and start to affect and potentially bias our judgments. This is something that has been researched a lot by psychologists. Uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky were two psychologists who studied this early on. You may have learned about their work if you took Psychology 202. This is called something called the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is our tendency to reason about the frequencies of events based on what easily comes to mind. So if you've seen a lot of news coverage of homicides, you'll think that they're more common because they come easily to your mind. Okay, let me do another example. Imagine we're going to play a little game. I'm going to give you three numbers. I want you to try to figure out what's the rule that's behind me giving you these three numbers in the sequence. So let's say I say to you, two, four, six. And now my question to you is, what's the rule? So I want you to try to figure out the rule. And then the way you can find out if you're right or wrong is you give me the next three numbers and I'll tell you whether they still follow the rule. So take a moment, imagine you're gonna do this for real. I'll pause, I'll wait. You're actually doing it, right? Okay, so your job is to figure out the rule, generate the next three numbers, or generate three numbers that you want to me to tell you do they follow the rule or not. Okay. So suppose you think to yourself, and this is a very common answer, I think the rule is numbers that increase by two. So what a lot of people will do is they'll say, okay, you gave me two, four, six. I think the rule is numbers that increase by two. So in order to test whether I'm right, I'm gonna give you eight, 10, and 12. And I tell you, yes, those follow the rule. You think, great, I got it right. But the problem is, yeah, those fit that rule, but eight, 10, 12 fit a lot of other rules that could have been the case also. What if my rule was, it can just be any three even numbers? What if my rule was any integers at all? What if my rule was just numbers have to be increasing? All kinds of things, right? There could be any sort of rule. The problem with this kind of approach is it reflects something called confirmation bias. This is a very common part of human thinking. All of us do it, everybody, which is that we have a tendency to seek out, pay attention to, accept, and remember evidence that confirms what we already think. So to go back to that example, if you thought the rule was numbers that increased by two, a way to test that would be to give me three numbers that don't follow that rule. If you said 9, 11, 13, and I said, yeah, that fits also, then you would have known that your rule is wrong. But instead, we have a tendency, and we see this all over the place in human thinking, to look for and remember evidence that supports what we already think. This is something that there's a lot of scientific methods and procedures that try to get us out of this. Scientists ourselves are very vulnerable to this, and we have a lot of checks in place to try to avoid it. Okay, I want to talk to you about a third way that intuition is different. This one's a little bit meta, and I think it's super interesting. This is from research done by a, a researcher named Emily Pronin. So as you might have guessed from those two examples, there's a whole area of psychology that studies biases in human cognition, some of the ways that our thinking might go, go awry. Um, what Emily Pronin and her colleagues did was they described these biases, the availability heuristic confirma confirmation bias, as well as a bunch of others, eight in total. They described them to people in a survey. 
And then they asked them two questions. First question was, to what extent do you believe that you show this effect or tendency? So if I say to you, here's what the availability heuristic is, and I ask, how much do you think you fall to the availability heuristic? You would give me a rating. And then I ask you, to what extent do you believe the average American shows this effect or tendency? You give me a rating on that. Well, guess what they found? Across all eight of these heuristics and biases, people agreed with the researchers. They said, yeah, that makes sense. People do this. I think the average person does this quite a lot, but I am immune from it. So the average person said that they were immune to being like the average person. That doesn't quite add up. This is something that Pronin and her colleagues called the bias blind spot. And this is a real challenge, even for scientists, that even when you know about these biases, we have a tendency to underestimate how much we're going to fall victim to them relative to other people. We might think we're too smart for that. This isn't about being smart necessarily. This is just about how the human mind works. So I've given you some reasons to at least not rely on experience, intuition all the time. But I said, you know, science is empirical. These are empirical. What's the difference? Well, scientific empiricism is different from everyday empiricism in two very important ways. One is that it's systematic. By systematic, what I mean is that scientific empiricism follows a method or a plan that's designed to lead to valid conclusions. So we step back, we say, how are we going to collect evidence? How are we going to analyze it? in order to reach valid conclusions in ways that hopefully don't fall to some of these biases and and blind spots. The second thing about scientific empiricism is that it's verifiable. So if you're introspecting on your own intuitions or your own experience, that's inside of you. Scientific empiricism is verifiable, meaning that it's done in a way that others can check the work or try to reproduce it themselves. So if I say I've done an experiment and it's led to this conclusion, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at the details, see if they lead you to the same conclusion. And if you want to, you can run the study yourself, see if you get the same evidence. Now, how do scientists do this? How is scientific empiricism, this systematic and verifiable approach carried out? Well, guess what? That's what this class is about. That's what we're here for. And that's what your next two classes or three classes or four or five, if you stay on in psychology, you're going to be about to. We're going to talk about exactly how scientists worked out ways to be systematic, verifiable, empirical, to produce hopefully valid knowledge that can help us in the world. Thanks for watching. Be sure you do the concept questions at the end, and I'll see you guys next time.